So now it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, James Westbrook. He's one of ours. He's an alumni. Um, he's from Missouri also, from St. Louis, so that's good. And he's, yeah. Um, he is the, recently he's, he's, he's planning a new church in Oakland with his wife, Desiree. And um, I looked on your website, I think you're 136 days from launching. So yeah, we're, we're looking forward to see that. Thank you for coming and uh, thank you for sharing with us. Welcome, James. Good morning, Gateway Seminary. Good morning. Oh, I'm going to be talking with you this morning. Good morning, Gateway Seminary. Good morning. All right. I'm so glad to be home. All right. No matter where Gateway is, I'm home where, uh, whenever I'm there. Amen. And uh, I'm so thankful to be able to have the privilege to uh, speak to a body of people, a faculty that's helped to shape me in my ministry. Um, and I'm, I'm so thankful. So it's truly an honor. And, uh, and I, I give some of that honor to Dr. Orge, uh, who has shaped my ministry uh, and s still shapes my ministry even to this day. Uh, as I tune in and I, uh, I read uh, his, his um, messages, uh, I'm going to just do this first, uh, read his uh, messages and his, um, his blogs, as well as my brother Adam Groza, a deep friend of mine. Uh, we see each other down, but so glad to be with you all today. I'm going to ask you to pray for my voice. Uh, I was talking this morning with a couple of faculty, and, and so down here you ha guys have the pollution. Up there we have the allergies, and so I'm bringing some allergies down with me from, uh, from the bay. Uh, so uh, let's pray that my voice uh, uh, stays intact here. I'm going to be talking about the topic of liberating leadership, liberating leadership. And so uh, before I go into why I'm talking about this in our text, uh, let's go ahead and pray to the Father for some help. Father, as we open your word right now, help us not to take for granted this awesome privilege and freedom that we have in this country. We have brothers and sisters all over the world right now, God, who worships you, Lord, who's full of your spirit, God, from fragments of your word. And we stand here with your whole counsel. Let us never take that for granted. I pray right now as I preach your word, Lord, that you would use me as a vessel to encourage your people, but also to encourage me as I'm preaching your word to myself right now. For two or more are gathered, there you are in the midst, Spirit, and we definitely welcome your presence here in our hearts, in our situations, in our circumstances, in the seasons we are in life right now. You know what they are, and we pray that, Lord, that you're speaking to us even right now regarding those seasons, God, whether it is seasons of bounty or, Lord, seasons of poverty. Speak to us now, Lord, for your people who are listening. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen. So I'm talking to you about liberating leadership, and this is a message that comes directly from the field. It comes directly from the field of church planting. And so what I hope you hear this morning as I open up 1 Thessalonians regarding leadership is the testimony of one who needs to hear this encouragement as we are on the field of one of the most lost places in the country, and, uh, and that is the, the Bay Area. And so as I'm doing this, I want you to know that I first preached this to myself, and I'm preaching to myself even this morning. We're coming from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And I, I want you, uh, second, second chapter, verses 1 through 8, I want you to go and turn there with me. Paul is going to write to the Thessalonians after receiving report from Timothy about how they have been, in my vernacular, holding it down for the sake of the gospel and how Paul's work was not in vain. After he had gone there to witness and evangelize this area, he receives good report from Timothy and said, praise the Lord for what you have been doing and you all are imitating me and what I have done. You're imitating what I've done. There has been some reports most likely about Paul and about his ministry. After he leaves, there are people that are entering into these communities and they are bringing accusations against Paul. 
And Paul is writing back, telling them that, listen, praise the Lord for what you have continued to do, but you yourself know what my reputation was in that place. And he's going to lay out for them what that reputation was as he is speaking in almost a polemic way. He is speaking in the defense of his ministry that they know all too well. But while he's talking about and defending himself and, and laying before them what they already know, there are some key things in here that, that brings balm to the soul of leaders and of future leaders because these are things that Paul made sure he was not entrapped to, that he's telling them, you know that I didn't come to you that way. Let me go ahead and read the text for us this morning. Paul says, verse 1, chapter 2, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts." For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. Let me remind us of the vision that was laid before us several years ago by Dr. Orge regarding the mission of why this institution exists. The mission of this institution is to shape leaders who will expand God's kingdom around the world. This is the way in which this institution serves the churches of the convention by helping to shape leaders who expand God's kingdom around the world. Shape leaders. Five years ago, I was able to graduate and I went into the field and, uh, as a director of a not-for-profit in the inner city of St. Louis in the middle of Ferguson right when it was happening. I was dispatched from the church through the training and with the help of the training of Gateway Seminary to also be a pastor of a mega church there in St. Louis, namely The Journey. From there, I went and I was a pastor of another church, namely Sojourn Community Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And now I have been dispatched and sent from that church to Oakland, California, the most diverse city in the country, in order that God's Ephesians 3, in order that his manifold wisdom may be made known and may be revealed and demonstrated locally through a church right there smack dab in the middle of a lot of social, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic tension. That word, that ideal leader, this is what it looks like. And this is my report five years later. Hey, here's how it's going. And here are some things, here are some things that I've been noticing that I need to hear. And I hope that this is something that's helpful for you. Because that idea of leadership, that is a beast. This idea of what it means to be a leader, and, and if I'm honest this morning, and maybe it's the same is true for you, that you, you ask the question, your soul asks the question, how in the world are you and me, how are we going to sit under the scrutiny of success when it comes to leadership? With leadership, there is so much that happens in the soul. There's so many expectations. There's so much that happens at the, at the deepest part of what we are. Lord, when you dispatch us into the world to expand your kingdom, how do we do that as souls free and liberated to live out your gospel in a way that it doesn't crush us? And anyone who's had any taste of leadership knows that leadership can crush you particularly when that leadership is based on something that God has not based it upon. We ask the question, will I be successful? 
will my ministry grow? It doesn't matter if you're going to be a pastor or the ministry of a social, of a social entity or the, um, maybe you're leading a, a youth ministry or maybe you're leading ministries that will help orphans or the most vulnerable in our society. Whatever your ministry, whatever the ministry that the Lord has called you to, dispatch from the church, the local church, the questions are all the same. Even if you are in academia, the questions are all the same. Will I be successful? Ministry is shifty. You have to deal with people in ministry. Can I get amen? I tell people all the time that, listen, ministry, my ministry will be perfect if I didn't have to deal with people. The second people enter in, my ministry becomes imperfect. Don't worry, professors. It's in the Greek and the Hebrew. It's, it's hidden behind there somewhere. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Of, of course, we, uh, in time we step in the church, it becomes imperfect as well. But people, you, we deal with this. People will leave you. People will doubt you. You will doubt yourself. And is this really the image that God has for, for, for ministry that we be crushed under the pressure of the outside? And the reality is the insurmountable pressure of leadership too often in ministry becomes a bondage of enslavement. Has anybody ever been there? Have you ever been tempted with ministry to say that I don't want this because this cannot be from God? This is from the field. We are often a slave to our hopes of success. I think that when we read what Paul is saying here, there are four entrappings. There are four entrapments that Paul says that I have avoided and I have not become enslaved to, which allows Paul to do what we see in verses 7 and 8, to, that he may flow in a liberated leadership, in a leadership that just lives out of this life-giving gospel. See, that's the type of leadership that I want. It's not one that is always worried about, am I going to be successful? How many people are going to come? How many people are going to like me? How many? This is the appropriate place to preach this because this is the place where we train leaders and turn them out and send them out. Paul says there are several things that I have avoided here. The first thing we see Paul avoiding here when it comes to his ministry as Paul says, he, he, uh, he avoids being enslaved to ministry manipulation. Thessalon Thessalonians, I want you to imitate me. I want you to continue to imitate me. But you yourself knows that I avoided ministry manipulation. Where do you get that from, preacher? I get that from verse 3. He says that for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. These are very interesting words that Paul uses here in explaining this text in the right, in the, as he writes this letter. He says that my appeal to you in the gospel and preaching the good news of God for you in Christ, that it did not spring from, come from, era. This word era is what we get the word planet from, wandering. It did not spring from this wandering from truth. It was always rooted in truth. It does not spring from, truth, from uh, dishonesty. It's, it's from and is rooted in truth. But it says our impurity. This is a very interesting word. This word impurity, it has a sexual connotation to it. We have to understand this a little bit more about the world in which Paul is writing in to understand why he would use this very particular word. During the time of, of Paul in the first century in the Greco-Roman world as he's writing, you're talking about a place that literally has a plethora of a plethora of a plethora of religious options. And often what you had was Paul entering into spaces where people were literally trying to get people to follow after their religious practices, after their particular philosophies. And we all are probably aware of this idea of the temple prostitute. These are leaders in, the, in these philosophical movements that would say that if you want to commune with the gods, then women, you have to give yourself over in a particular way sexually with the priest of the philosophical movements if you want to commune with God. These are people that, that used to bait people and bring them in and bait the most vulnerable in their society and then said that do this so you can commune with God. 
People are accusing Paul of doing this. And Paul says that, you know, that's not why I came. I didn't come and do with, with impurity. There's nothing about this ministry that I do that is self-seeking and self-serving. It's not, it doesn't point to me. It points to other to another. It points to Jesus himself. And then he says that, or any attempt to deceive. I didn't come to you with impurity. I didn't come with you with any attempt to deceive. That word deceive, it means fish hook or bait. I didn't come with to you with these fish hooks or, ba- or baits or theatrics to gain converts. Now, this is something that is very concerning to me. This is something that I have to constantly fight off in my own ministry, figuring out what the next bait is, what the next trick is. How do I get to the crowds? Paul says that I did not think of anything clever or any tricks or any gimmicks like the rest of the world or that I did not approach you like the rest of the world did. I approached you with the full counsel of the gospel. That's what I had. I didn't lie to you and say, come to Jesus and be rich. I never said, come to Jesus and you will never suffer again. I never said that Jesus comes just so you can know how to have a better marriage. I didn't come to you just so you can know and reduce the the fullness of the gospel down to what it means to be a better parent. Now, these things are not anti-gospel. It's the fruit of the gospel. It's not the gospel. He says, I didn't come to you. Someone told me that, James, if this is you, if you did this, God bless you. There's no judgment. I'm pretty sure your motive is pure and holy unto the Lord. Someone said that, James, you should look at this person who did this right here. They literally dropped thousands of Easter eggs from the sky, from hot air balloons, and said that this is Easter. Have fun and joy. Now, I'm pretty sure that person had a very pure heart as well. I did not come to criticize. The point is, is that for James Westbrook and Realm Church, when I look at that, I look at the pictures, I look at that, I am tempted immediately from looking at the social media pics to then begin to ask the question, what must I do to draw the crowds? And Paul says that, listen, that is not the type of pressure or ministry manipulation that he wants us to sit under. He says that I did not come to you with anything, no bait, anything. I came to you just with Jesus. That's how I came to you. And in the ministry, and in, as a church planner, if I can just be open to you from the field, as a church planner, there's often the question, how do I get to the crowds? How do I get to the crowds, and, and how am I going to get people to see who Jesus is through my particular strategies? I had a 30-page uh, master plan about how I was going to reach everybody, from events to budget to everything, the whole thing, lights, camera, action. I even had smoke coming from the pages. And I said, Lord, this is the way I want to do it. I tell you right now, literally nothing happened the way I wanted it to happen in the nine months I've been there. And I'm saying that, Lord, what about page 13? Page 13 says this, and that's not happening. Paul says that, listen, rid yourself from sitting under the scrutiny of your own strategies. Strategy is not bad, but that's not how we have the harvest that the Lord has for us. Our, our, our particular objective is not bad, but that is not what the Lord promises as to how he's going to bring the harvest. No, it's by crying out to him and praying that, Lord, will you bless this means? And if you don't bless it, that's OK. But would you bless it that people may come to know you. So I had to get off of this, off of my back, the temptation to sit under ministry manipulation where I'm trying to bait people by these non-gospel centered means in order to get them to know who the Lord is. Paul says that I didn't come to you like that. That's not a temptation that I had to work with. No, I came to you. See, when we don't do this, it affects what we proclaim. Since whatever we win people by, I had to learn this. Whatever we win people by, that's what you have to keep people by. Whatever you, whatever you use to win people, you have to use the same thing to keep them over and over and over again. And so Paul, by not doing that, it helps him to avoid my next point. Two, Paul was not enslaved to people-pleasing. 
We see that in verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, approved by God to be entrusted with this wonderful, beautiful news of God's atoning love for, for the world, so we speak out of that entrusting. Not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts, for we never came with words of flattery, as you know. Paul was not enslaved to people pleasing. Paul knew that it was ontologically impossible to please both God and man at the same time. That is mutually exclusive. They cannot work. Paul says that I did not come to you to do that. If you do not believe that it is a huge temptation, I don't know where you are in your ministries. It is a huge temptation to do this. It is a huge temptation not to say to say it differently over and over again until the thing is reduced down to non-offense. Paul says that, no, I, I, I didn't reduce God's ministry to what it should mean or, or, or how it should sound to you to such a way that you approve of it. Why is this so difficult? Why is this so difficult even for James Westbrook in, in Bay, California? Why is this so difficult even in your ministry context? Trying our hardest to keep that person from leaving. Ignoring the signs that is best to part. You're going to have to come to that conclusion. Many of you already have in your own ministries. Being and doing everything for people so they can think well of us. At all costs, costs never disappointing people. Why is that so difficult for us to do? It is because we fear the scrutiny of success. We fear what will happen to our ministries. It is quite ironic to me that Jesus, when we are looking for the crowds, Jesus is often leaving the crowds to get away that he may have intimacy with the Father. It is quite ironic to me that when we are looking for the crowds, Jesus himself is saying things such as, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and the crowds disappear like roaches in light. And he turns to his own disciples and says, Will you leave too? It is a, t- t- a temptation and a constant temptation for me. I'm going to tell you as a church planner, listen, I have eyes on me from around the country because of my relationships around the country and living all over the country. I did not want to say anything controversial for the first four years of the plant. Don't ask me anything about a hot topic issue. Just throw me a soft lob. Just give me a, do I think that Jesus is awesome? Yes, I do. (laughs) Hey, preacher, what must I do to be saved? Amen. Come on, bring that on. But no, the reality is, is that we're called in the ministry that Paul was called to, and he never stopped, even when he was just beat up for proclaiming this gospel right before he got to this city in Philippi, and he, was, and he keeps going. He doesn't say, let me switch up the method, let me change the message, what, what's going wrong. He doesn't say, he says that, all right, well, it's not necessarily working here, or maybe it works in small part here. We preach the gospel, praise the Lord, let me get on to, Thess- uh, Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians in Thessalonica. He says we, we, we cannot be enslaved to people pleasing. And the last word I would say about this is that this is a growing concern for me. Because the more and more we, be, we, we look at the success of ministry by how many people are in our ministries. Listen, the Lord is blessed, Realm Church. We are growing. The Lord, people are coming to know the Lord. People are tr- being transformed right now. Praise the Lord. That's happening. We see fruitfulness in the ministry. Praise the Lord. But the second, I'm sorry, I got small ears. <laughs> but the second people become the measuring rod by which faithfulness is to the ministry is measured then we fall into this enslavement that Paul is saying that he's avoiding. See, people are not at the center of it. Paul is entrusted with the gospel. His, his, his assignment is from God himself. It's faithfulness to what has been given to him for people. He says, do not be enslaved to people pleasing. Thirdly, Paul says that he was not enslaved to materialism. He was not enslaved to materialism. We see that in verse 6. He says that I did not come with a pretext for greed. 
God is witness. I did not come with a pretext for greed. This is very interesting to me. The word pretext, it is, it's this word of cloak. It means that I did not come with a cloak or with something hidden. Kind of like me. I'm going to confess to anyone who's going to watch this, I'll confess to you all. Don't say anything to Oakland. When I came to Oakland, I have a pretext or cloak of a desire for uh, LeBron James. That's my, yeah, that doesn't quite work plenty in Oakland. Uh, but no one has to know. <laughs> All right, I'm going to love Golden State Warriors, and I'm rooting for them. Praise the Lord for Golden State Warriors. Uh, no, I hope that there's no offense. You guys are in this thing too, right? Okay. He, he says that, listen, I didn't come to you with a cloak. You knew exactly what I was all about, but the cloak was not for greed. I think that that's got to be the most foolish cloak to have if you are in ministry right now. If your counselor told you to get into ministry that you may make some money, you need to get your refund back. Ain't much money in this thing. However, there is a way in which you can engage in ministry with that as your motive. Sometimes we enter into ministry with these desires to be a platform minister with whatever ministry that we're doing. Maybe sometimes it doesn't start from a place of, Lord, use me. My heart breaks for this. My heart breaks for that. Lord, use me. Use my life. Use me, Father. Change life. Break chains. Bring people to know you. Bring them out of bondage that they may come into the realm of your son. See, sometimes it's motivated that I get into this thing or I get into seminary that I may get the book deal. That, that, that people may think more of me. That people may follow me more. That, that if Paul is saying that, listen, don't do that and I didn't do that. It's important to do that because that is not what the ministry is about. But let me tell you something. As it pertains to soul care, that will crush you. And it will crush me as well because everything we do is going to be to the end of something that doesn't necessarily come easily and it's a hamster wheel. And the problem is that even when we get it, the hamster wheel, we have to keep it going. It crushes I love this ministry swag that Paul moves in. He says that I'm not here for money. Luke 12, 15, we're reminded of, of this warning. Then he said, Jesus, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The success of our ministries are not determined by the abundance of our possessions or the abundance of our buildings or the abundance of our budgets. Our success is determined by the faithfulness of our caller to and with the faithfulness of our callings. This is something that Realm Church James Westbrook needs to know. I'm going to preach to myself today. I need to know this. Is while we're looking for buildings and looking for what it means to, to demonstrate how God has been faithful, this can be the temptation that is going to be with the lights, the cameras, the action. That does not mean ministry faithfulness. Paul says that I am not bound to that. Fourthly, verse 6, Paul says that I am not enslaved to self. I'm not even enslaved to my own self. Verse 6, he says that, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. This has got to be one of the most humble people that I've ever seen. We're talking about the most successful evangelist in the history of the Christian world. He says that I did not come to seek glory from people, from you, or from others. That is not why I came. The word there, glory, or doxa, it means at its root, it's opinion. It has the connotation of opinion or praise or favor. I did not come that you may have a good opinion of me or a favorable opinion of me. I did not come for that reason. Does our Lord not say that the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory? That is like getting in a river that has a way, a current, and has a direction. It is hard to avoid getting in that river without going 
with it. If you have to intentionally, I have to intentionally go against this. Did they like my presentation? Did they like my church? Do they like my people? Are my people weird to them? We we look quirky. He says that I did not come that you may have just the best opinion of me. I came that that doxa may belong to Jesus, that you may have proper opinion about who the Christ is. I love what, uh, what Jesus says again, how can, in uh, John 5, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? That's not why I came. In your ministries, in your classroom, and whatever you're doing right now in life, who are you leading for? Who am I leading for? For whose opinion are we grinding for? Is it for the applause of people or the applause of God? That God may look at our ministry and from heaven applaud us because of our faithfulness to him. We're told over and over again that when we do it for people, that would be the fullness of our reward. The Lord knows I do not want just that simply to be my reward. Not being enslaved to self means freedom from building platform ministries for personal glory. Paul, he was not enslaved to ministry manipulation, thinking of the next gimmick and trick just to get people to come. And that doesn't mean that we can't be creative about how we engage people. He does not measure his success in ministry that way. Paul was not enslaved to people pleasing. He was not enslaved to materialism, and he was not enslaved to self. And I believe that that is really what leads to verses 7 and 8 in terms of his freedom to do exactly what he was called to do. Verse 7 and 8, Paul was then free to lovingly lead. Don't you want this type of freedom to lead in ministry where you don't have to be so afraid and filled with anxiety and fear about the success of what you do? Don't you want this type of freedom in ministry that says that, listen, the, the, the start and end of this thing does not start and end with my ability, but ends with the power of God? See, I thank God that when we planted this church and the work that we're doing that is not in accordance to what I have in the bank account, is not in accordance to what I had in the bank account when I first started this work. Because if that was the case, then I should have stayed where I was. But through God's faithfulness and him pouring his favor out all over the country and different parts of the world, we are literally at a place, place where we're saying, okay, Lord, what should we do with the resources that you have provided? Praise the Lord. I want a ministry that goes way beyond me, way beyond my wisdom, way beyond my strategies, way beyond my abilities. So I can then be able to lead in such a way where I can say that, Lord, I entrust the result to you. Verse 7 and 8, what does he say? This thing is, whoo, sorry. He, verse 7, he says it, but we were gentle among you. You know that, Thessalonians. We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Do you hear the heart? So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. This is the heart of ministry. I believe that this is the very reason why this school and why churches entrust his, his students to this school, that we may be trained and shaped as leaders to expand God's kingdom around the world, Why? that we may freely work with this heart. It's the heart, God's very heart. You know that I did not do all of the other things that reduce people down to objects, objects of, of, of our desire and what people make us, how they make us feel and crushing people under us and, and our particular sins. He says that, no, I treated you, I was gentle among you. It reminds me of, of what Paul says in Romans 9 and 2, being free to love the Lord and not to, to people in ulterior motives. It reminds me, he says that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for Israel. It's a man that says that my ministry can be found in, in who my heart breaks for. 
Who does your heart break for? I hope that, and I constantly ask myself, and I have to remind myself that, why are you in this? Why are you doing this? Because I want people to come to know the Lord, and I want my people to grow deeply and more deeply in the Lord and their love for Him. And most of all, I want to grow into deeper affection for the Lord. Jesus came that we may have intimacy with the Father, and he himself never, ever allowed that to go to the wayside in the name of ministry. Paul's heart breaks for those that he ministers to. And whatever that is for you, whatever that future is for you in whatever field, whether you are a professor and your heart is breaking, that your student will get it. Not for the sake of just having it in their mind, but they may be able to worship God more accurately and adequately in accordance to what his word actually says. Whatever that may mean for you, whether you are leading women trapped in the sex industry, Little boys growing up without fathers that need to know the love of a greater father. Whether that be trying to help people abstain from, from substance abuse and addictions. Whether that be to see the church live out its commitments to be a place for any person. Our hearts must be broken for people. And as I, I close here, I think that we only get at this type of freedom with not just posting it, not just stating it in the negative of what we shouldn't do in terms of being enslaved to all of these different areas, but also in the positive of what we should do. Quickly, let me read Mark 4, 26. I love this picture of how the kingdom advances through the church through the work of believers that the Lord has called in his church. Jesus says this. This is, what, this is what the kingdom of God is like, Mark 4, 26. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. So, some of us, we need to take a class. Maybe that's a, I don't know who's going to teach that, a theology of sleep. Some of us need to just understand that in our ministries, in the areas that we're preparing for right now, and in the ministries that we're leading in right now, we have to learn what it means to sleep. What it means to sleep. That means that the kingdom of God is such that even when you're not working, oh yeah, while I'm down here, I'm thinking that, Lord, don't let the church fall apart. Don't let my people become cannibals and start eating one another. <laughs> I think God is saying that, brother, I got it. Go on down there. <laughs> Try to be faithful as much as you can with this word. Listen, we have to learn how to sleep because whether we are doing, resting, whatever we're doing, it is the Lord that provides the increase. Let us trust in the gospel that is in the hand of the Father. It is a provenient love that God pursues people that they may respond to him and his love through his son. That is the way that the Lord gathered you to his church, and that's the way that he's going to gather others through your ministry. Let us rest in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I pray for us right now, and I pray for myself especially. That, Lord, as we are trying to pursue your great commission, that people may come to know who you are, that our people may grow deeper and more deeply in love with you and hate their sin more and love you more and love their neighbor more. I pray, Lord, that as we are doing that, that our heart breaks for them. And that, Lord, our heart is affectionately desirous for them and not for ourselves and ulterior motives, Lord. If that is us, Lord, help us, Lord. Help to, to get that out of us, Lord. Help us to be victorious over it, to a broken spirit and a contrary heart. To this you will draw nigh, your word says. Lord, will you help us when we're tempted, when we're tempted, Lord, to go back into enslavement that you did not die for. In the name of Christ, amen.